welcome to this tutorial session. It is my privilege to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's session, uh, Professor Panos Kouvelis. Uh, Panos holds the title of Emerson Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Operations and Technology at Olin, Biz Olin Business School, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, in addition, he serves as the director of the Boeing Center for Supply Chain Innovation, a leading research center at WashU that focuses on supply chain, process excellence, business model innovation, and technology management. Panos is a prolific researcher. He is ranked a top five operations management researchers in terms of uh, research productivity, quality, and citation with over 12,000 citations. His extensive contributions include publishing nine books and more than 130 journal articles. And furthermore, he has held prestigious editorial positions for all major journals in his fields. His accolades are numerous. In 2022, he was honored with the Distinguished MSOM Fellow Award, the highest honor to be bestowed upon a research scholar in the operations management field. In addition, in 2016, he received POM uh, Palm's Lifetime Fellow Award in recognition of his lifetime intellectual contributions to the profession through research and teaching. Panos has been a pillar of support for the MSOM Society, having served as its president and chair of the iForm SIG. We owe a debt of gratitude to him for his invaluable contribution to our research community, especially the iForm community. In the realm of supply chain risk management, Panos has worked on the integration of operational and supply chain uh, financial hedges. His work uh, in, in supply chain finance explores the intricate interplay between operational and financial decisions. And today he will enlighten us uh, further on this very topic. So just diving a bit into his education background, Panos earned his doctorate in industrial engineering and engineering management from Stanford University. He earned his master's degree in business administration, uh, business administration and industrial and system engineering from University of Southern California. He also holds a diploma in mechanical engineering from National Technical University from Athens. Uh, please join me in welcome Professor Panos Kovalis. Thank you. Link, thank you for, uh, for uh, the great introduction. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Harry and uh, Abru for being very patient as editors of the tutorial of uh, op operation research this year. As usual, I was late. Uh, <laughs> and I had to be prompted a few times, but the editing was excellent. So it is my pleasure to introduce the tutorial on integrated uh, supply chain finance, or uh, the abbreviation uh, ISCF. We are going to take a supply chain centric viewpoint of managing working capital, hedging and uh, risk management. My main motivation is when uh, you search uh, out there for the term supply chain finance, what uh, typically you're going to find is something very narrow. So the usual definition will be like the one you see there. Supply chain finance, also known as supplier finance or reverse factoring, is a set of solutions that optimizes cash flow by allowing businesses to lengthen their payment terms to their suppliers while providing the option for their large and SME suppliers to get paid early. A very narrow definition of a financing schema within supply chains. And reflecting on what our area has done uh, the last 20 years uh, under the umbrella of supply chain finance is something a lot richer, uh, dealt with a lot more issues, more complex situations, and there's a development of foundational knowledge that I believe uh, should be credited by using uh, the right term. So I would uh, try to somewhat redefine supply chain finance with a new term of integrated supply chain finance. And uh, using an iPhone idea is ISCF, in case you're trying to sell it. <clears throat> and uh, the definition is that integrated supply chain finance is a portfolio of effective operating financial and risk mitigating practices within supply chains. Definitely reflects the strategic concerns of uh, the firms within the supply chain and the decision making agents. And as an objective, you try not only to optimize working capital for liquidity, but also account for the effective use of the assets for uh, profitability and risk control. So this uh, umbrella covers 
in a much better way, much more inclusive way, what we have done as an area, and I believe the contributions are uh, significant, and I would like to highlight them as much as I can. So you recognize the features of the definition is, uh, first of all, is uh, the view of our field of what happens in supply chains with a complex multidisciplinary decisions that are made, interaction between operational decisions and financial decisions and risk management, always, of course, linked uh, to financial performance. Definitely, we have that view of integrated supply chain finance where we try to uh, understand and integrate the different type of flows, the physical, the information, the financial flows, uh, especially this workspace, uh, putting more emphasis on financial flows. Uh, definitions of uh, what the firm cares about. Of course, liquidity is important, but definitely within supply chains, you care about overall profitability and managing risks. And for sure, we always viewed the management of risk within supply chains, taking this type of integrative perspective. The best way to manage risk in supply chains is by combining the operational and the financial hedges, the uh, integrated risk management term we have used. So that's really uh, what is the thematic umbrella we're pursuing under this uh, redefinition of, uh, of that particular uh, field. And the four themes that I'm going to discuss uh, today, uh, I might have to go a little faster in uh, some portions of it, uh, are the following. First of all, dealing with financing of working capital in uh, supply chains. There, we look at financing schemes, but we try to understand how these financing schemes are affecting the equilibrium decisions within the supply chain. The wholesale prices, the order quantities, and then uh, uh, trying uh, to have a supply chain-centric argument for the use of these contracts. We are going to argue that financial hedging uh, in support of uh, supply chain operations is something we should be doing in a little more of a longer term perspective as we try to understand how financial hedging might allow the firm to make the right operational investment decisions over time and use a cash flow hedging of a framework and try to extend it from the single firm level to the supply chain. As I have argued, a theme we have pursued very effectively is the theme of integrated risk management, and uh, the results uh, do change depending on the application, so I will uh, highlight a little an application that actually Ling Dong and I worked uh, together on a global capacity planning with an integrated risk management perspective. And finally, I will touch upon the more recent work on uh, extending supply chain contracting ideas where you start account accounting for financial uh, constraints, financing frictions, bankruptcy and bankruptcy cost, and also other environments where you not only deal with demand risks uh, with coordinating contracts, but also input side risk, especially commodity prices in the presence potentially of uh, financing frictions. So that's really the big thematic umbrella. I will try to touch upon uh, ideas. So you can view the tutorial as an effort to expose ideas and not necessarily models and specific results. And uh, uh, definitely I, I have no way to do a literature review and there are many people sitting in the room that they heavily contributed to it. I will uh, rely on uh, my work and uh, highlight uh, as they relate to the ideas that I'm presenting here. But as I would like to emphasize, this field has been developed by many people and the contributions of many. And uh, I'm just touching upon some ideas by using uh, my own work. Uh, if you would like uh, to see the papers, uh, more or less, that uh, the presentation is relying on are uh, listed on uh, this particular slide. And of course, <coughs> the uh, overview uh, of the presentation is uh, very nicely summarized in chapter 10 of the tutorials in operation research and the version of it, uh, much uh, shorter uh, version, is uh, the uh, thought piece that followed the MSOM fellow presentation, which has been published online in MSOM. So with that said, let's uh, go into the first theme of uh, supply chain financing, financing schemes for uh, working capital within supply chains, and we are going to start with work in the uh, trade credit area. I'm going to argue that, of course, there's a lot of uh, theory out there and a lot of work that has been done in economics and finance about why trade credit practices are used by suppliers. And I'm going to argue that we're still missing a supply chain centric argument and hopefully I can provide that. So the usual arguments go as follows. Uh, suppliers are better able to evaluate and control the credit risk of buyers. 
they can uh, grow their business uh, by attracting new customers with the use of these practices, definitely allows them to build uh, better relationships and loyalty uh, in their business uh, by financing <coughs> the needs of uh, their customers. They tend to be very effective in environments where you have weak uh, banking infrastructures and uh, many other capitalized SMEs that need financing. And of course, it's much better to give to your customer uh, inventories of physical goods instead of giving them a loan of uh, cash, uh, which can be diverted and sometimes used uh, for uh, fraudulent purposes. But what I'm arguing is uh, we are missing the full understanding of how these type of traded credit contracts, when used within a supply chain, affect equilibrium decisions. Decisions on wholesale prices and order quantities, and hopefully from that start understanding uh, the uh, logic of, of their use within the supply chain. From a modeling perspective, we are going to model what we like to call the push uh, type of a supply chain. You have the supplier as a Steigelberg leader offering a contract that has a wholesale pr price and some trade credit provisions, and the retailer responds with an order quantity. So you can see our effort to somewhat capture the strategic complexity within the interaction of the players, and of course the uncertainty in terms of the demand. The essence of uh, the results that you find in this type of work I summarized on uh, this particular slide. So I assume that you have a certain uh, trade credit contract with a trade credit uh, priced at some interest rate. And you would like to understand the, re the response of the retailer in terms of the order quantity as a function of the wholesale prices. And uh, you see two curves right there. The blue curve is summarizing how a news vendor retailer that he has no financing concerns is going to respond. And uh, the red curve is the curve under the trade credit contract. But before we go there, uh, let's see one more curve. And this is the curve of uh, the situation where the retailer is going to finance uh, his or her needs by using bank loans that are fairly priced. Fairly pricing the risk depending on the order quantity. Now, uh, you can uh, start uh, focusing on uh, the middle uh, of uh, the graph, what we call uh, the retailer's bankruptcy region. The retailer gets aggressive enough uh, in terms of their order to have the potential of, uh, with some small probability of bankruptcy, that is the bankruptcy region. And as you can notice in that region, the retailer for the same wholesale price is going to place a larger quantity relative to either the traditional news vendor or uh, the one with bank financing. So that is effectively uh, the main insight uh, behind this uh, type of uh, <coughs> Steichelberg game uh, that is happening there. And uh, the next is going to try to give us a little uh, insight of how should we price uh, the trade credit. Uh, at this point in time, we start uh, with a curve uh, at some interest rate rather high, and we will start lowering it towards the risk-free rate, and we would like to see what happens uh, to the red curve. So uh, dynamically, uh, you can now see that effect. So as you're lowering the uh, interest rate that you're charging for the trade credit, uh, you can see the curve moving uh, northwest. For the same wholesale price, the retailer gets uh, more aggressive in terms of their order. Uh, of course, it's a risk-neutral retailer uh, pro protected with limited liability. They can only lose uh, their uh, sales revenue in low demand realizations. The supplier is willing to encourage uh, the retailer to take the risk and uh, price the trade credit uh, rather cheap. And uh, in expectation, the supplier makes more money by uh, ending up in an equilibrium price that is uh, higher and at the same time a much larger order quantity than uh, the retailer would have ordered rather the same wholesale price. So this is what I call the supply chain centric argument for our trade credit practices, which somewhat was uh, missing uh, in uh, the previous uh, theory. Uh, the emphasis on the why, uh, why is the trade credit uh, uh, cheap? Now we understand and you do the analysis and you can see that anything between zero and risk-free rate can be a part of the equilibrium. Uh, and uh, you can see the difference uh, of the trade credit, which does not fairly price the risk, regardless of the order quantity is the same uh, interest rate, versus the bank, uh, where depending on the order quantity and the risk, is going to adjust the interest rate, and that uh, basically makes the difference. Uh, the retailer end up buying more than they would have bought uh, under the same wholesale price, uh, even in the presence of bank loans. And uh, for most of the cases, the equilibrium order quantity and wholesale price are higher 
than under the wholesale price contract. Uh, who benefits? Uh, of course, in this type of a Steigelberg model, the supplier always benefits. Uh, the retailer, in most of the cases, uh, from a modeling element, the retailer commits something to the transaction or a little working capital or some collateral. So therefore, if you don't have much, that's what we call a poor retailer. The poor retailer might would have preferred a traditional wholesale price contract. That was, an op was not an option offered, but when the supplier offers the trade credit, they accept it. And from a supply chain efficiency perspective, as the order quantity increases, the supply chain efficiency improves. So this is the example of what I call supply chain-centric uh, arguments, understanding the use of financing schemes uh, within supply chains. Then uh, there's uh, uh, work uh, that, uh, that I did uh, with uh, Fasen Xu and appeared in um, uh, Management Science that uh, looked at the other financing schemes. Uh, where the supplier is trying to uh, finance uh, accounts receivables. And uh, typically you do it through some form of factoring. Uh, you find an institution that is going to factor your accounts receivables. The traditional definition of uh, recourse factoring is the situation where you really borrow using your accounts receivable as a collateral. And, uh, of course, you're liable until the end uh, uh, when the invoices are paid by uh, the downstream player, the retailer. In the case of non-recourse factoring, effectively, you are selling your accounts receivable to the financial institution. And you are not any more liable for what happens with uh, invoice payment. And uh, the reverse factoring, which as we saw, uh, which as we discussed, uh, was really the term that was used for supply chain finance. In that situation, motivated by practices of the last 20 years or so, very large corporate buyers extended payment terms on their suppliers, and in order to lessen the financial pain, they uh, gave an opportunity for the suppliers to work with a bank of the buyer's choice and uh, sell their accounts receivable to them using the very high credit rating of the buyer. So that is uh, the supply chain finance uh, definition that was given uh, in the popular literature, but as we argue, it's just one of the financing schemes. And uh, our emphasis in that work, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details again, our perspective is for each financing scheme, we would like to understand the impact that it has on the equilibrium decisions within the supply chain. The wholesale prices, the order quantities, and then after we do that, start comparing financing schemes and which one is preferable by the supplier or the retailer. So that was what was missing in the literature. I won't spend a lot of time on this modeling. I'll just uh, tell you that it's very different than what happens with the trade credit. Now we model a pool supply chain which is really the retailer that goes ahead as a Stagelberg leader offering a wholesale price and the demand forecast, and then the supplier will respond by placing an order and carrying the inventory risk. <clears throat> so the supplier has to finance uh, the production period, uh, T1, uh, let's say potentially with, uh, with a bank loan, and then the extended payment period uh, finance uh, the accounts receivable, uh, either going to a factor or going to a bank. Uh, so uh, the example that I have here is the pure bank financing of all the needs. Um, it's not necessarily uh, because I'm trying to make uh, <coughs> details of this particular financing scheme, but just to show the kind of results that you're trying to get. So now you start modeling the supply chain and the players, but you got to introduce some new considerations which are very important. There's a liquidity risk uh, of the firm, which depends on its credit rating, and um, we model that as a Poisson uh, shock. And then you have exogenous factors that might uh, drive uh, a credit default uh, for either the supplier or the retailer, which we model as uh, binomial shocks, some default probability depending on the credit ratings. So these considerations will come in on how you write uh, the objective function of the players, Obviously, very important when you uh, try to find the appropriate cost uh, that the supplier uh, uh, bears is not only the production cost, but the relevant financing cost, which is nicely captured into these kind of models. And finally, the results that you get for the different financing schemes is the equilibrium in terms of wholesale prices, order quantities, given by these type of equations that you have seen in equilibrium of pool uh, supply chains. Again, I won't get into the details of that. Uh, 
M many of the insights rather straightforward. Credit rating of either part increases or a liquidity risk decreases. Uh, you expect wholesale prices to go down, production quantities to increase, and an expectation both parties make more money. In uh, modeling the different financing schemes, uh, the uh, uh, crucial element and where you got to carefully see how you model is the cash advance that the supplier is going to get at time T1 when they borrow or uh, sell their accounts receivable. And that's where is the difference in terms of the amounts that is going to drive the differences in terms of the implication of financing schemes for uh, equilibrium decisions. And uh, the kind of results that you'll find in the paper is uh, start comparing <coughs> uh, for uh, different parameters uh, of uh, the model when will the supplier prefer uh, recourse factoring, the pink, versus the non-recourse, the yellow, and uh, the reverse, uh, which actually <coughs> on my computer is, uh, is a gray, but here it appears more as a white. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that is, uh, but uh, the, uh, the main argument here you can see, uh, it is not necessarily true that always the supplier will prefer non-recourse over recourse. Uh, suppliers with very high credit ratings uh, might prefer uh, a recourse uh, factoring. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> excluding the, uh, the reverse, forgetting about uh, the white for a while, then you can see uh, that in most of the instances, of course, the non-recourse factoring is going to be uh, preferred. But when you introduce the reverse factoring, uh, then we can see that it will take some of the business of the traditional non-recourse factoring, but not all of the business. Still, there are certain uh, areas where the traditional non-recourse uh, will uh, dominate. So this is the essence of uh, the kind of results uh, that we try to get there and providing the supply chain centric argument for uh, factoring and reverse factoring, as we said, implications for uh, equilibrium <coughs> quantities on wholesale price and order quantity. And uh, at the same time, give us an opportunity to debunk some myths that are there. Uh, recourse factoring uh, is always dominated by non-recourse. That is not necessarily so that reverse factoring is always a win-win situation, not always, depend what are the other financing schemes, and in a few cases, suppliers might prefer either recourse or traditional non-recourse factoring over reverse. And uh, when the <coughs> uh, retailer designs an optimal um, uh, reverse factoring program for multiple suppliers, it is not necessary that uh, extending payment terms is part of the optimal design, and uh, you can find situations where uh, the reverse factoring will be preferred by both retailer and supplier without any extended payment term uh, included. So that is uh, the quick uh, coverage of uh, the first theme, uh, the <coughs> supply chain financing. And now we are going to switch a little and uh, come into the area of uh, using financial hedging in support of decisions within the supply chain. Uh, which, of course, it starts by uh, looking at our supply chains, which we typically assume that the firms, supplier and retailers, are uh, risk neutral. And the very first question is, why would uh, risk neutral firms want to think about cash flow hedging? Uh, well, definitely we'll borrow the argument from corporate finance and the presence of the appropriate financing frictions uh, and other uh, frictions that will allow us to make the argument that firms do care about protecting their cash flows against uh, random factors. But most of the arguments have been provided within a single firm setting. And what we are going to argue in our work is uh, you got to extend it within a supply chain. Uh, that is the right system to think about cash flow hedging. And uh, within a supply chain, there is the risk of transmission or uh, in the presence of not hedging, some risk can maybe be transmitted from one partner to the other as a result of their uncertain cash flows. And that is exactly what uh, supply chain cash hedging is going to capture, and I'm going to explain how. So let me start uh, by uh, giving a little of the argument of why should firms uh, hedge their cash flows, uh, risk neutral firms, uh, trying to hedge uh, their uh, cash flows. So go back, uh, think a little about the way that corporate finance people uh, tend to argue. So you're looking at your balance sheet and on the left is where you make investment decisions, operational investments, and on the right you do the financing. If you have perfect markets, no frictions, financing independent of the investment decisions. So if you uh, would like to argue, you got to start by bringing some frictions that is going to break uh, the Modigliani-Miller. 
uh, the frictions that will be argued uh, in these type of settings by the corporate finance is, uh, well, you do need ways uh, to finance your investments and uh, uh, going and borrowing a lot, it exposes you to potential uh, bankruptcy risk and cost and going to the market uh, using uh, equity uh, to raise funds uh, definitely might be signaling and there might be other agency considerations to consider. So because of those frictions, as a firm, you would have a preference to finance the needed strategic investments to generate value for your firm by reinvesting your operating cash flows. And your operating cash flows are the ones that are exposed to the random factors, the commodity prices, the exchange rates, the interest rates that you are trying to protect against. And that is more or less the justification of why you will consider making the hedging so you can guarantee to have the right level of cash assets to invest in your operational investments. And uh, if you see the argument, somewhat you guarantee that by taking money from the good states of the world and uh, funding the money that you need in the bad states of the world. It's an elegant argument uh, that is made in the paper by Fruit, uh, Sarstein, and Stein. It's a classic paper, but the emphasis is single firm. So the opportunity for us is to take this into a supply chain setting and basically argue that uh, it makes perfect sense when we consider uh, investments within the supply chain of the different partners and trying to understand how the hedging choices of one partner might affect the other and the notion of the potential of transmission uh, of our risk. Uh, an unhedged supplier has highly volatile operating cash flows that get reflected in highly volatile wholesale prices and in expectation might result in higher wholesale prices. And an unhedged downstream buyer might not be able to make the right investments to have what is needed to respond to the different demand environments and that might uh, move away from the efficiency of the chain and uh, end up with lowering ordering quantities. So therefore, there is an opportunity uh, to try to make the argument within a supply chain setting and see also what it brings for us. So uh, the first thing that uh, uh, we are trying to uh, clarify for uh, people thinking about operational decisions within supply chain is when you think about financial hedging, especially in this level of more strategic interaction, you do need to think about hedging your overall cash flows. In most of the cases, we tend to think about hedging the demand side to change rates, hedging this commodity risk versus that commodity risk. But the best way is to think about the effect, the aggregate effect of those random shows on your overall cash flows. That allows for some natural pooling uh, of the risk and therefore only need uh, to uh, hedge the residual risk. And at the same time, you are looking at both sides, the revenue and the cost, uh, and uh, depending on the situation, uh, some of it, one of them might be more important than the other. So we are going to argue that this is the right uh, level. Uh, at the same time, the hedging here is not on a transactional level, on a short-term transactional level. We are talking about firms participating in a supply chain over a longer-term relationship. Uh, let's say in the car industry, you develop uh, car models for six to eight years and you choose suppliers, strategic suppliers uh, for the whole duration. So the relationship is uh, much longer and uh, the logic of uh, the hedging choices of your partner might be important in the investment decisions that you make. And as we argued, uh, within those type of settings, uh, we are arguing that you do depend on what uh, your supply chain partner is doing with uh, his hedging, our hedging choices. And we're going to demonstrate that. I'm not going to get a lot into the uh, modeling of, uh, of uh, this uh, particular environment, but I got to give you a little of the flavor because uh, it will allow us to better understand the results. So you're looking at the operating cash flows of a firm and uh, you can potentially hedge them, uh, which will allow you to have a certain level of cash assets that you are going to invest in improving the, uh, uh, the cost uh, structure of your firm. So that's where the cost of the firm uh, is uh, the level where you start the small c multiplied by the famous production efficiency function. So in the production efficiency function, the way we look at it is for a certain outcome, efficiency means you're using less input. So the production efficiency will allow you to lower your cost if it improves. And uh, the crucial assumption here in the model when we start is the production efficiency function is assumed to be convex and decreasing on the cash asset. Uh, as a result of that, a hedge firm will end up with lower expected cost relative to the unhedged firm. 
Now the supply chain is not anymore responding to a news vendor environment, uh, faces a linear, a linear inverse demand type of a setting, the A minus BQ that you see there. Making the argument, <coughs> uh, first uh, starting it from the single firm level, when you write the expected profits of the firm in that particular setting, what you're going to see, it has two terms. The one which heavily depends on expected cost, as if the firm had no flexibility in its actions, and another one that accounts for the fact that the firm potentially can postpone, see the cash flow realization before making the decisions, especially with respect to the output and the prices. So really the expected profit is for a firm without flexibility plus the value of the flexibility. So when you compare the expected profits of the heads versus the unheads uh, firm, what you are going to see is two opposite effects. Uh, hedging allows you to reduce your cost, so that's the cost reduction effect that is positive for the hedge firm, but at the same time you lose the flexibility to postpone your decision and that is the loss of the value of flexibility which is negative. So those two things are opposing each other, creating a trade-off, and the interesting thing to observe here is as you increase the market size, the cost reduction effect uh, increases and at some point in time will overcome any loss of flexibility. So the kind of a result you expect is a threshold result. Above a certain threshold of uh, the market size, you hedge and below that, you do not. And obviously, uh, the larger the market potential, more prone to hedge and the less volatile the cash flows, again, the more prone to hedge. So this is now the argument that we try to extend within a supply chain setting. And we can do that, but also you have to deal with uh, an, an extra element of complexity. So you now you have the operating cash flows of the two firms, and the question, the question is, do they correlate or not? And if they correlate, how? Uh, the analysis is much uh, cleaner, and uh, we're going to start from it, uh, is by assuming independent cash flows. So in an independent cash flow environment, uh, which can happen, because remember supplier and buyer might be operating in very different industries, uh, let's uh, say we would like to extend the argument, let's start the analysis by the manufacturer's expected profits. The expected profit of the hedge manufacturer versus the unhedged manufacturer. Again, you're going to see a cost reduction element and you're going to see a loss of uh, flexibility argument uh, opposing each other. The interesting part is the flexibility effect of hedging for the manufacturer depends heavily on the hedging practices of the supplier. And then an hedge supplier increases the volatility of cash flows and actually increases uh, the loss of flexibility when the manufacturer hedges. Uh, the cost reduction effect more or less is of a similar nature. The larger the market size, the larger the cost reduction effect. So again, you expect to see these type of threshold results. So if you have a, a hedge supplier, you're going to have a lower threshold above which you start thinking of hedging. If you have an unhedge supplier, you need a larger threshold before above you are going to hedge. So now in that environment, above the high, you hedge. Below the low, you do, uh, do not hedge. In between, you do what your supplier does. So that is uh, the result that we're going to get in that setting. Very similar type of uh, result we're going to get for suppliers. And finally, uh, the question is, uh, what are the equilibrium hedging choices of the supply chain <clears throat> in the case of independent cash flows? Uh, the mathematics are a little more difficult. I'm pretty loose on uh, the interpretation. But the essence is, how does the volatility of cash flows affect uh, the production efficiency and the variance of the production efficiency? If it's rather small for the manufacturer, definitely the manufacturer is prone to hedge. Uh, definitely that will be the case for very large market sizes, but for modern market sizes, what you see is again, the manufacturer is more likely to hedge relative to the supplier. Symmetric result for the case of the supplier. And if the production efficiencies, the variance is rather similar, then more or less they tend to align their hedging choices. So we start uh, getting an essence uh, that within the supply chain setting, we have some uh, interesting understanding of how each partner may be affecting uh, what is happening on the cost reduction effect and uh, uh, value of flexibility of hedging. And uh, they don't always make the same choices, but definitely uh, if, uh, if uh, one is uh, prone to hedge, typically will drive also the other to be more interested in hedging but don't necessarily make the same hedging choices in all times. The interesting part of uh, the <coughs> extending the argument within the supply chain is when you start uh, having correlated cash flows. 
And that's where the analysis gets a lot more difficult, but the insights are getting a lot more interesting as well. Uh, so the uh, very first uh, uh, is, of course, you have a cost reduction effect and the value of flexibility, and you can model them, and uh, things get a little uh, more interesting with the introduction of the covariance of uh, the uh, cash flows. But before we go there, uh, let's uh, say for an environment where we take the argument that the production efficiency was convex, the one that drove the cost reduction effect. Let's say the production efficiencies were linear and therefore there are no immediate cost reduction. In the case of positively correlated cash flows, the hedge firm has an advantage in the cost reduction. You are thinking really about the product of uh, the two costs. Uh, the expectation of the products is the product of the expectations plus the covariance. If it is positive, that is enough motivation for uh, the firm uh, to get a cost reduction, even in the absence of convex in production efficiency. That is a new argumentation for why hedging might happen within supply chains. That was not in the literature before. For sure, the covariance plays a big role in uh, the cost reduction effect. It has to stay above a certain level for the cost reduction effect to stay positive. That level is some negative number, but as far as you are above it, you still have a positive cost reduction effect for the hedge firm. If you have really negative uh, cash flows, uh, really negative covariance of uh, the cash flows, uh, the, post, uh, the cost reduction effect uh, can change sign. And in that case, uh, both the value of flexibility and the cost reduction are arguing for not hedging. So that is, again, an interesting result. So the cash hedging framework is, I believe, important for us to understand uh, the, the way we make operational investment decisions within supply chains. Uh, it is uh, important to see the logic of these two opposing effects that very clearly carries through when we do the analysis with independent cash flows. And the results there clearly indicate that it's more likely to hedge when your supplier partner hedges uh, and the market sizes are larger. And it's not necessarily true that always you make the same hedging choices as your partner, but you're more likely uh, to follow them when uh, the partner hedges. The uh, correlation of cash flows uh, um, introduces a new argument of why hedging might be happening and why you might be getting a cost reduction effect in the presence of positive uh, covariances. And in a certain situations, for very negative covariances, we might see that uh, both effects are arguing for not hedging in those situations. Now, the integrated risk management, which is uh, work we have done over many years, and uh, uh, we have written books uh, with uh, Ling Dong and the Noor, and uh, there's a lot of work in a lot of different applications, and uh, here I will just touch upon uh, the main idea. Uh, in a particular environment, integrate risk management in uh, the case of uh, global capacity planning. In the presence of demand uncertainty and exchange rate risks, uh, a paper we, we wrote in 2007 with Link. It has been a while since then. Uh, so, uh, I uh, give you a little of the conceptual argument, right? So, we are arguing that for a global supply chains in managing certain risks, you need the combined use of operational hedges and financial hedges. Uh, the way operationally we think about hedging risk uh, is the following. For us, uh, the operational hedging is a two-stage problem. The first stage, we make investment decisions, we structure our supply chains, put our capacities in place, and then later, closer to the market and seeing the realization of the uncertainties, we reoptimize the system to take advantage of what has been realized. So really, the hedging operationally comes from uh, the flexibility we have built in uh, the structures that we have created and the opportunity to re-optimize the system by making decisions later closer to the actual uh, situation. So flexibility and postponement are the main uh, logic of drives the operational hedging, using the flexibility by choosing locations where we produce, choosing the mix of products that we make, choosing suppliers that we're going to choose from, or choosing the markets that we're going to serve. So this is the logic of the operational heads. The financial heads, especially in environments that have macroeconomic uncertainties like exchange rates, uh, commodity prices, interest rates, and so on, uh, as long as the markets are reasonably liquid, you can find uh, the right financial contracts, forward or derivative contracts, and you can head some of those risks. And uh, the popular thinking is in many cases, probably financial hedging is all you need for these type of environments. 
But our argument is for certain situations, actually, the operational hedges are extremely important. Uh, and in those situations, some combined use might be the, f the best integrated risk management approach. So uh, motivated by some uh, great uh, slides that uh, <coughs> Link developed uh, as we were presenting the paper, I will give you a little of the logic of this kind of an argument. So let's start for the argument where uh, financial hedging is all that matters. So if I have an account receivable, I'm an American firm, accounts receivable in Europe in three months of two million euros, my exposure is what is going to happen over the next three months in terms of the exchange rate uh, and uh, how much am I going to collect. Uh, this is rather easy for you to hedge. Just go and sell a forward contract uh, on uh, the on the exchange rate uh, for a quantity of uh, 2 million euros, and uh, that is all you need, and you have a zero uh, variance uh, hedge. Uh, that is the case. Of course, uh, these kind of transactional exposures, either uh, receiving uh, amounts uh, of what you sold or uh, sourcing contracts, uh, that's all that you need. Uh, we're going to argue that even for those environments, you should know a little about the flexibility that you might have uh, in exercising uh, what is really happening in the environment. And the uh, simple uh, next uh, example, too, is trying to give you that sense. Well, I have an opportunity to sell something in Europe, a million units in three months, but then as I come closer, I might decide if it's worthwhile or not, depending on what is the realized exchange rate. Just to put some numbers, you have a price of 10 euros, you have a cost of five, and as you come closer, uh, you're going to decide if it's profitable for you, otherwise you're not going to do it. If that is the case, if you have that type of flexibility, now your risk exposure to the exchange rate is of the kink profile that you see there. So would it have been a mistake to buy a forward contract in that case? Of course, you can uh, really create a zero variance hedge by buying the, uh, or actually in this case, selling the right call option contract. Uh, so the ones that are hedging financially should at least understand the flexibility in executing uh, contracts or uh, operations uh, in buying the right financial hedges. But we're arguing that for environments, especially in global supply chain, uncertainties either on the demand side or the competitive reactions of the other players uh, make it very hard for you to hedge your exposure uh, purely with financial uh, hedges. And actually, the power is going to come out of the ability when you see the environment to reoptimize uh, your system. So the first example is going to go and say, well, uh, similar situation, the price 10, the cost 5, but I don't really know what is going to be uh, the demand or the sales uh, in, uh, in Europe. And we have a simple function there, 1.2 times some random factor xi times some dependency on the exchange rate. The exchange rate is dollars per euro, so therefore as it gets bigger, the Europeans feel richer and want to buy more. Uh, the issue is that when you plot the uh, risk exposure profile, of course it's non-linear, but then non-linearity is not the issue. The issue is you don't know at what level that thing is because it gets affected by the random factor. In those cases, there's no financial hedge that is going to do the job for you and the operational hedge will allow you to optimize your profits. Similar kind of uh, very hard to know exactly the risk profile will be a situation where whatever happens in terms of exchange rates, it heavily affects the cost structure of yours as well as that of the competitor, and you don't know what is the competitive action they're going to, do, to take. So it's in a simple kind of a Cournot kind of a setting, you committed to sell one million, you don't know how much they're going to sell, that is going to determine uh, the price in the market, and therefore, depending on their reaction, you don't know what is the exposure that you have for that particular realization of the exchange rate. So these operational or uh, uncertain demand or uh, competitive exposures are the ones where operational hedges are very powerful, and we're going to argue potentially some financial hedges is there needed. So, of course, the modeling, and I don't have the time to go through of the, mod the modeling, but I want you to get the sense of what kind of a model you need. To have the operational heads in place, you need a two-stage setting. Uh, decisions that are made in stage one, which here will be, we have a stylized setting, two markets uh, trying to decide uh, where to locate and how much capacity in the presence of demand and exchange rate in both markets. Here I even wrote a simpler version of the problem 
But in the first stage, you are making capacity decisions and you are buying financial contracts. In the second stage, closer to the realization, now you decide how you're going to optimize and how are you going to allocate what you produce and where, and at the same time execute your financial contracts. The reason I present all these mathematics without going uh, through the notation is I want you to see, as we write the operational profit expression, you start seeing within them the notion, the mathematical notion of the option that is there, right? The S minus S plus, the positive part in a call option, you're going to recognize it in different expressions. So by understanding the uh, execution of your operational profits, you start seeing the uh, real options that you have, which potentially you can combine uh, appropriately with the right financial hedges to allow you to massage uh, the expected profits. In uh, these type of problems, what uh, we realize is the first uh, is the following. If you give me the structure of the supply chain, all the decisions, what you have in place, and the capacity you have in place, and so on, by understanding the second stage uh, operational profits and somewhat seeing the nature of uh, the options that are there, potentially what might be natural uh, uh, strike prices that I would like to consider, uh, optimizing the head size of the different uh, call options you're going to put in place for your portfolio to uh, get the optimal uh, head is not a very difficult problem and is a problem that can be solved with a uh, system of equations. What in these problems is really difficult is the first stage problem. When you try to go and make the decisions about the capacities and the locations, and it uh, gets uh, really difficult, even in a simple example. In this particular case, it's the simplest of the cases where we decided we only locate in the domestic market and we try to figure out the capacity selling to the foreign market. Uh, it gives you the feeling when you look at the first equation that is somewhat of a news vendor. But of course, uh, in this kind of model, we assume the hedging by assuming the objective function of the firm is some form of a risk averse, uh, in that case, a mean variance objective function. So that is going to come into the complexity of what you see in the equation to determine the optimal capacity. And the argument now, will the risk averse firm put more or less capacity than the risk neutral? In this simple example, always will put less than the risk neutral. And uh, the presence of the operational heads and the financial heads is going to move it very close uh, to the optimal capacity of the uh, uh, risk neutral decision making. So uh, anyway, uh, hopefully you got the flavor. The operational hedges are extremely important in many environments. Uh, when you think about global supply chains and the risks they face, uh, in most of the cases, the structure of the global supply chains and the flexibility you built in it is what will account for the increased uh, profits uh, that you're going to get. That's uh, the heavy contribution to value and expected profits will come through the operational hedges. As you start thinking about the problem of managing uh, expected profits subject to some risk constraint, potentially in the tail of the profit distribution, uh, the f flexibility that you are adding within your supply chain might also spread out the profits of your distribution, which now you will need the financial hedges to manage the risk constraint. And by managing it effectively, it allows you to pursue policies that are closer to what the risk neutral supply chain manager would have done. Uh, the argument, at least in that literature, that why we don't risk minimize and uh, use uh, natural hedges to eliminate risks of exchange rates. So you produce in the market uh, for what you sell in that market, that is the natural hedge argument. Uh, definitely the global supply chain makes more expected profits than a natural hedge supply chain. Uh, that is uh, well proven in uh, this literature. So uh, hopefully uh, you start seeing the role of the operational flexibility and hedges contribute to expected profits. You have to worry a little about uh, some of the downside risk and uh, with the right financial hedges it will allow you to massage it. And by massaging it, it gives you the opportunity to execute uh, the more aggressive uh, risk neutral uh, actions that are needed in the supply chain. So that is uh, the main insights of uh, that literature. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of work. And I can refer you to an edited book that has all of it. Right? <laughs> so uh, very good. So now I'm going to uh, touch upon um, uh, the, uh, the last part of, of uh, the work uh, we have done, 
which is uh, trying to extend uh, the supply chain contracting theory uh, to account for financial constraints or account for risk on the input side. Uh, the supply chain contracting uh, theory is, is very rich. Uh, we have a lot of work uh, that has uh, documented that in the typical uh, stylized supply chains of uh, a supplier and uh, a retailer uh, facing demand risks, um, that uh, all type of contracting uh, contracts can be coordinating, uh, revenue sharing, um, buyback, two-part tariff, uh, quantity discount. Um, those are some of the contracts, and there are other coordinating contracts as well. But uh, generally, in uh, that environment, there's no discussion about the need to finance working capital, face financial constraints, or have financing frictions. And we wanted to understand how all of that is, uh, is uh, going to affect uh, the coordinating contracts in that environment. Uh, this is work that uh, we did with uh, Dan Kotursic, uh, uh, who is also sitting in the room today. Uh, now, in order to try to provide a set of contracts that will encompass all of the previous coordinating contracts in the literature, or almost all of them, we use a three-parameter contract that has a wholesale price, a revenue share, and uh, the capital T, the side payment at the end of the season, and more or less they capture the more interesting coordinating contracts. And we're going to do the analysis in the presence of uh, financial constraints, and we're going to see that the revenue sharing logic continues to work reasonably well, but it will require some sharing uh, that will involve reallocating the loans between the players, which means adjusting the working capital levels they are having, which makes it harder from an implementation standpoint. But it can work uh, for those type of settings, as uh, we're going to argue. But as you do the modeling, you also need now to think about what happens with bankruptcy cost. Most of the literature will assume bankruptcy cost to be of a variable nature, in many cases linear, depending on the level of realized sales. But we argue for, for administration purposes, in many cases there might be some fixed costs that have to be accounted for and actually complicated the nature of coordinating contracts. So I'll give you a little of a flavor of uh, what is happening in uh, that uh, research. Uh, and <clears throat> the, the, the three-parameter contract is uh, reasonably straightforward. Uh, just to give you a moment to think about it, uh, wholesale prices that could be functions of the order quantity, the retailer's uh, revenue share, theta, the supplier one minus theta, and you might have some fixed money transfer at the end of the sales season from the supplier to the retailer if that capital T is positive. You can even analyze a case of negative. Uh, of course, uh, revenue sharing contract very nicely captured here. You say a revenue and you say a cost uh, and there's no uh, side payment. Uh, the buyback contract, the traditional way we think is leftover inventory gets bought at some buyback rate. Uh, if you think the buyback rate being one minus theta, you can construct an equivalence uh, to the three parameter contract that I describe here. And the main characteristic of that contract is that always the T is, uh, is a positive number. And finally, quantity discount contracts, very easy with wholesale prices being functions of the order quantity. The uh, default cost in terms of the modeling, we have to account for, for the variable, uh, which in many cases assume linear, but it doesn't have to. But you need to introduce that extra term, the small beta, the fixed cost associated with bankruptcy. We will uh, maintain uh, very similar uh, functions uh, for all three players, of course, adjusting appropriately the parameters. Now, the logic, of course, if you go there, as uh, we have seen in the supply chain coordinating literature, Let's for a moment uh, concentrate on the uh, yellow part. So if you write uh, the expected profits of the retailer and the supplier under the contract uh, of the three parameters, the omega, theta, and uh, tau, uh, that's more or less what you're going to get on the yellow part. In the decentralized supply chain, the total profits sum them up. Start thinking about the centralized uh, system, which is uh, going to, of course, uh, have only pr the production decision and an order quantity. You can see how this type of contracts are going to appropriately uh, coordinate uh, the decentralized and centralized chain. What is missing as soon as you start introducing uh, financial constraints is their expected default losses of each one of the players. So you have the expected default loss of the retailer, of the supplier, in the decentralized supply chain, you add them up and you got to compare them with expected default loss of a centralized system. 
that uh, has the total working capital, but potentially in a low demand realizations uh, can be exposed to bankruptcy and therefore might have itself an expected default loss. So coordinating the expected default losses is really uh, where is the action uh, in this uh, type of an environment and what it also makes it uh, very hard. Um, you have to carefully read the paper to see uh, the careful build up of how we model uh, these uh, expected default losses for a retailer, supplier, centralized system that will allow us uh, to provide insights. <clears throat> so uh, the main insights uh, that, uh, that you get out of, uh, of uh, this work, and uh, it's quite complicated, I will just give you the main insights. If you don't have any uh, fixed default cost, so you only have variable default cost, uh, uh, could be linear. Uh, then uh, the uh, coordination, coordinating contracts, uh, either revenue sharing or buyback contracts can work. Uh, the revenue sharing actually uh, is, uh, is the one that we're going to emphasize a little more because it's, uh, what it will be re required, the revenue sharing logic of coordination is very simple. If you share everything, uh, you'll do really well. You say a revenue share cost, uh, you got to find a way to share loans according to the revenue share. If you manage to do that, then it can be coordinating. But that can happen only by adjusting the working capitals of the two players, which potentially, if you had full information, you could do it uh, through wholesale prices. So in concept, the revenue sharing contract will continue to coordinate. But definitely in that environment without uh, any fixed default cost and only variable default cost, the quantity discount contract will fail to coordinate. And uh, you can see in its structure because only one player borrows and there's no way to adjust uh, loan amounts. The fixed default cost actually uh, start generating interesting insights if you go down that way. So the simplest uh, case uh, is uh, you are just uh, for the centralized system adding up the default cost of the two players, that's what we call the absence of economies of scale. And if that is the case, then the decentralized system has an opportunity to outperform the centralized because they can borrow in a way that the player that has the lower default cost is the one that borrows more. So you get into a situation where you don't have an upper bound on what is the best performance of your system and finding the first best contract gets uh, reasonably complex. So anyway, uh, it gets uh, quite interesting uh, thinking about coordination in the presence of financing frictions, but somewhat the logic, uh, more or especially the logic of the revenue share, seems to be carrying through. And finally, uh, the, the work uh, that more recently appeared uh, in, uh, in MSOM, in, um, M again work uh, with, uh, with uh, Danko and uh, Mike, uh, my collaborator, Wen Hui Zhao, was uh, trying to understand another aspect of the supply chain contracting literature uh, somewhat understudied. So most of the supply chain contracting is, as we said, the stylized environment of the supplier, retailer, demand risks, and uh, not a lot of emphasis what happens on the input side and uncertainties on the input side. In this case, we're going to concentrate on commodity prices as being the main uncertainty to model. Uh, we would like to see, first of all, in the presence of commodity risk, how the coordinating contracts work. That will require certain indexing and potentially some penalties, as we're going to argue. And then adding the potential complication that in that environment also you have financing frictions uh, in the presence of uh, commodity risk within the supply chain. So the modeling is uh, slightly different in terms of the timing of the decisions that uh, becomes important. So you have the uh, supplier offering a contract that is going to have a wholesale price and some revenue sharing uh, type of uh, provisions, and we're going to argue for uh, potentially some uh, penalties <coughs> at uh, time zero. At that time, the uh, downstream player, we'll call it the assembler, is going to place an original order for which uh, the supplier will go and order components that are going to be delivered in time T1. At that point in time, uh, sees the realization of the commodity prices, may decide uh, to not produce, uh, but hopefully in most cases they do. And if they do, that gets transferred uh, time T2 to the uh, assembler. At the same time, they will get any other commodities they need from the outside and then make a decision, potentially adjust their original uh, production decision. Uh, even more, sometimes they might even uh, stop uh, producing. And finally, if they produce at uh, time T3, you sell to the market, uh, linear inverse demand market, 
and uh, realization of all of the uh, uh, payoffs. <clears throat> So this is uh, the setting uh, that we have uh, for the model of uh, commodity prices within the supply chain. Uh, the modeling in terms of uh, modeling commodity prices, rather standard binomial trees uh, between time zero and time T2. And uh, the uh, interesting part now is uh, the type of uh, contracts that we're going to consider for coordinating is a wholesale price that is appropriately indexed. And actually, you see three different elements in that wholesale price. The first one indexing on the uh, commodity one, the one that the supplier uses. The second one indexing on the second commodity that the assembler uses. And then there's a third term that potentially might share revenue based on expected sales uh, and on the production quantity of the assembler at time T2 before we see the actual realization of the market in time T3. Uh, so there will be revenue sharing uh, components in the contract and as we are going to argue in a, in a little while, uh, some penalties will be needed in order to align the actions of uh, the decentralized chain with that of the centralized chain. So the main results in the paper will be a set of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions that will allow you to describe uh, the nature of coordinating contracts. These are the conditions that you see there, the three elements of the wholesale price and the penalty structures. And uh, in order to have a quick interpretation, let's assume that that term C1 you see there is zero. So what you see in uh, the wholesale price is you are asking uh, the, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the assembler to uh, share part of the uh, commodity cost of the supplier. And in the second, you are asking uh, the supplier to share some of the commodity cost of uh, the assembler. Um, uh, the third term is going to be zero, so there's uh, no side payment in that particular situation. And with respect to the penalties, uh, we are going to argue that there's no need for penalties. The wholesale price will be good enough to incentivize the supplier to do uh, what uh, the centralized system does. But the centralized system makes a decision about how much to order at time T1 versus the assembler is going to make a decision about what to produce at time T2. And at that point in time, they have different information, might make a different decision. And therefore, there's a need of a penalty to align the decisions of the assembler with the centralized system. And that is the nature of the necessary and sufficient conditions and the argument that I already gave that the revenue sharing contract with wholesale price is appropriately indexed and penalties uh, for the assembler, not uh, for uh, the uh, supplier, uh, is going to work. And that is one of the examples. Uh, Two-side contract appropriately structured can also work. In that case, of course, uh, you will need the third element in the wholesale price that uh, we described. So uh, this is uh, the situation of commodity prices without consideration of any financing frictions. Then what happens in that supply chain with commodity risks and in the place of uh, financing frictions? Uh, again, you can uh, study this class of uh, contracts and write the necessary and sufficient conditions and you see a contrast between the necessary and sufficient conditions without financing and with financing. And it gets a little more complicated. And again, the complication goes back into the notion that you got to adjust loan sizes and working capitals between players. Right? Uh, a revenue sharing contract, if you had all that information, you could do it. It's going to do it. A buyback contract will not be able uh, to coordinate in that type of an environment. Uh, and again, the uh, Prices are indexed on the commodity prices, and the penalty appropriately indexed uh, will apply for the assembler, not for the uh, supplier. So again, uh, the problem, you can solve it theoretically. You have a question of, uh, do you have an implementable contract? And uh, you might not, uh, unless you go to extreme cases. In the cases where both of the players uh, need to borrow heavily, in that case, a revenue sharing contract uh, is going to work uh, reasonably well uh, for those type of environments. Or the other extreme is the situation where only the supplier needs to borrow and the downstream buyer does not have financing needs. In that case, a form of a pass-through contract is going to work. So those are the insights that we get out of this uh, supply chain contracting work. And with that said, uh, this is my description of what is uh, this thematic umbrella. Um, I have to say, 
given the amount of time, I can only talk about my work. But I would like to emphasize, whatever we do, we do it as a community. Whatever you see here is a lot of work, a lot of ideas, a lot of research, a lot of papers that are written by many of you in the room and many of you that are not in the room today. So, thank you. Thank you, Panos, for this wonderful presentation. And I believe we have 10 minutes uh, left for the session, and we're open to any questions. Uh, so a Q&A session. Any questions from the audience, I will just go to you, and you can speak to the microphone. So Panos, thank you so much for this uh, you know, presentation and all the work that you have done so far, right? So, uh, so would you like to say a little bit about going forward, right? So what else? is waiting for this area, right? Uh, um, uh, general kind of uh, approach, you know. Thank you. Uh, uh, Noor, I think the whole area is open, right? So, <laughs> so each one of the themes that we just touched, uh, highly stylized situations, probably it was rather easy for us to say something. I believe there are a lot of financing practices that have to be understood from a supply chain perspective. Uh, a lot of environments are where we talk about the cash flow hedging as a concept and how the question is how are you going to do it in practice? What does it exactly mean, right? Within a specific environment, what do you hedge, right? How do you hedge the revenue versus the cost side in a, with a, this kind of a cash flow perspective? We try to give a little of a flavor in a paper with, uh, with uh, Danko, which was like running an example. But I believe the how-to of the cash flow hedging, right, uh, within a supply chain, I don't think we know exactly how to do it. Uh, the same thing is about integrated risk management. We keep on talking about the combined uses of operation and financial hedges. How many of you are you teaching anything in your classes about the combined usage of operation and financial hedges? And when you go into an example, actually tell them how to do it. Right? So that for sure is there. And on the contracting, I, so in a certain way, uh, my, the, the, uh, the working of the contracting literature was, at some point in time, people felt uh, supply chain contracting has finished. Actually, I think supply chain contracting has not even been touched when you start looking at the real practices where you do deal with financing frictions. And uh, information asymmetry and all kinds of agency considerations that some of our colleagues are working around. Right? My message is, whatever you see right here is absolutely open. We just put a few models, something that you can refer to make hopefully your life easier. But given the size of the audience, I, <laughs> I think the opportunity is there for the few that believe. So, Mike, so believe in integrated supply chain finance is the eye that makes the difference. <laughs> uh, so this question is from the perspective of somebody who hasn't worked in the area at all. I, I, I work in healthcare systems and operations research in healthcare. Uh, and and my, my question had to do with what are the practices that are currently used by companies? And are they thinking, is it ad hoc or is it, um, is there some structure to it? Or is there, in, in, in these models, have they penetrated to some extent? Or is it like people haven't even started looking at it? Or is there, are there empirical studies that are beginning to sort of touch on that process? So. So how is this very, very, very good uh, uh, question? And of course, uh, as, uh, healthcare has so many financial flows that have to be better understood, right? And contracts that uh, have to. Um, so uh, well, uh, in a certain way, uh, we are going uh, both uh, behind and in front, right? So quite a lot of the financing practices and all these kind of financial conducts are out there and they are used. Uh, why are they used? What are the implications? Sometimes not understood. So somewhat we came after and we say, oh, trade credit, we have an, uh, an understanding. And actually we generated hypotheses that now can be empirically tested and I think they start getting empirically tested. So I see a lot more of what uh, the theory here predicts. Uh, people start looking at uh, trying to see if that is the case. I mean, like uh, the argument, uh, do natural hedges is all that you need, I think empirically has been tested. Even though it wasn't very clear what was coming, uh, we gave an answer uh, to, to fully understand, right? Um, so now on the, on, on the uh, so what, what I find out is, is the following. In certain uh, environments where certain risks are extremely important, companies are highly sophisticated in terms of how they go about it and how they simulate a lot of kind of options, analyze a lot of scenarios, and might not have the nice, elegant, uh, or eloquent uh, explanation of why they're doing what they're doing, right? 
So some of the ideas of integrated risk management, I find it in industries, oil industry, right? Or certain industries with very heavy exchange rate exposures, right? Actually, sometimes I get surprised and I don't necessarily have an answer. So I talk to finance guys in certain industries where actually I think the operational side and the commodity costs are extremely important. And what do I see them doing is hedging their exchange rates. And well, I can assume they don't know, or it could be I can assume because they really understand the impact on their operating cash flows, that's really what matters. And simply I don't understand it, right? But that is the essence of what we do. We try to explain what happens, we give some ideas, we hope they tell us if they work. And in this field, I believe both sides are happening. And what is very encouraging, I see papers now that come my way to referee, uh, they have a heavy empirical component, which is very interesting. So if no more questions, I can end the session. Let's thank again panels thank for you. a wonderful <laughs> tutorial. And thanks, thanks the audience for coming to attend this tutorial. <laughs>